wanted to be the best actor. I still have a chip on my shoulder to prove that. I'm not in award-winning conversations. I want to be in those conversations. I ended up leaving the company because I wasn't afforded the opportunity to do stuff outside of the company. Deacon Batista is now one of the biggest movie stars on the planet. I don't think about myself like that. I'm just getting started. But I'm coming into my own. Do you feel like you made it to the top in wrestling? No, but I think what I did, I'm proud of it. Have you been slimming down? Absolutely. At 6'4", 240 pounds, next to your typical actor, it looked like a gorilla. You getting an evolution. Mark Jindrak, that spot. No, he never had that spot. I got injured. They didn't want to keep waiting for me. They thought they should fill the spot. So this episode with Batista has been a long time coming. I think we were talking about doing this for like the last year or so. But perfect timing here. His new movie called The Killer's Game comes out on September 13th. It's also the film debut of Drew McIntyre, who was just on the show last week. And if you've ever enjoyed any interview that we've ever done on the channel, could you at least just consider subscribing to the channel? And before we get to the conversation, this episode is brought to you by Factor. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. So no matter how busy you are, you'll always have time to enjoy nutritious, great tasting meals. I love this because it's so much easier and so much cheaper than ordering some food on an app on your phone and then waiting for it to come and then getting hungrier and then seeing all the delivery charges there. Here you just open up your fridge, grab a meal, pop it in the microwave, two minutes later, boom, that's it, you're eating. With over 35 different meals and more than 60 add-ons to choose from every week, you'll always have new flavors to explore. And we're talking like restaurant quality meals that feature premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, and blackened salmon. So head to factormeals.com slash insight50. You'll get 50% off your first box, then 20% off your next month. That's factormeals.com slash insight50. Yeah, 50% off your first box, 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. Now enjoy this conversation with Dave Batista. Thank you for making the time to do this. Yeah, thanks for being patient, man. We've been trying to work this out for a while. I mean, you're a busy man, so yeah. I appreciate the time. Yeah, hell yeah. What was the movie that first made you fall in love with acting? That made me fall in love with acting? Because I know when you got into it, yeah. you were just a wrestler. Yeah. And then you did some acting, you're like, but I'm still just a wrestler. Yeah, I, well, I did, you know, I did, <laughs> I did an episode of Smallville. And, uh, you know, I, I, I did it because I was a fan. I was a fanboy. I wanted to be on a Superman-related show. <laughs> I just had no interest in acting. It was, I, I wouldn't say I did a film and it made me fall in love with acting. I did a film that made me want to be better at acting. I did a film called Wrong, Wrong Side of Town. And I did it and I didn't think much of it. And I, you know, again, I was on top of my wrestling game and I loved wrestling. I was obsessed with it. That's all I wanted to do. And I went and I did this film and I realized what a horrible actor I was. Like so bad, I was really embarrassed and I just wanted to prove to myself that I could be better. I mean, I left that set just feeling unfulfilled, man. And I just wanted to, I had the itch, man. I just wanted to get better. And so it was, yeah, wrong side of town. It kind of started my whole, whole journey. It's pretty crazy to think that Deacon Batista yeah. is now one of the biggest movie stars on the planet. It's weird hearing that. <laughs> it's weird. Cause I don't think about myself like that at all. I feel like, uh, like I'm really just, you know, it's, I'm really starting to break into my own. My career is really starting to, it like took all these years to kind of I feel like I'm just getting started. Like now I'm starting to get lead roles. Now I'm starting to build on my career. And they're not like massive lead roles. Like I'm not doing massive, you know, studio, you know, 150, 200 million dollar films. Like I'm not on the top. So I'm not like a big movie star. Do you want to? But be? I'm coming into my own. Do you want to be at that I, level? I do. I do want to be at that level. And there's a particular reason. For one, I, I really want my company be, to be successful. Um, but also, you know, I've kind of learned throughout my journey that the bigger star you are, the more you can get things done. It's just easier to get things done, man. People are, you know, they're, it's, it's the nature of business. You know, if people see you as a commodity, they see that you can generate money. Same with wrestling. Yeah. You know, if they see that you can generate revenue for the company, then they'll make you a star. Is one of the hardest things about your position now is saying no to stuff? No, no, it's not hard you to say no. Either. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> no. not, it's not hard to, I turn down stuff all the time and it's just, you know, and then I turn down good stuff. It's just, you know, it's, I need, I have pieces of a puzzle that I'm trying to put together. And that's kind of the way I've, I've gone throughout my career. I like, I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this. And I hope all these pieces, pieces will lead to one big, beautiful piece of art. So if we yeah. look at the puzzle right now, how, yeah. how complete is that puzzle? It's, uh, 
it's it's pretty complete. I, I've got little pieces of it. Like I, you know, I still want people to see me as someone who can carry like a, you know, maybe a smaller, independent, dramatic role, and not rely on my physicality, you know, anymore. I, and uh, there's, you know, I haven't really completely broken into the rom com space, and I'd still like to conquer that, which is not. <laughs> you know, getting easier because I'm not getting younger. <laughs> so, no, I don't know how much, you know, people want to see, uh, you know, a guy in his mid fifties, uh, in a rom-com. I don't know. You know, I hope there's an audience for that, but I don't know. It's, uh, and, and, you know, but yeah, that kind of, there's still a few pieces that I'm, I'm trying. And I haven't done like a massive, I haven't like, I'm ho- hoping that killer's game turns into my John Wick. You know, I, I, I feel like, like multiple could. films. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I love the world. I love the characters. I love that there's, you can go anywhere with this. It's a hyper world or you can, yeah. we can go as far as our imagination can let us go. Yeah. Have you been slimming down in order to play these other roles? Yeah, absolutely. I, I started trimming down for a particular reason. Why? One, I started trimming down because I, I just got fat. I got fat. <laughs> Your version of fat yeah. is not fat. No, I got, well, I got really big for a role and it was uncomfortably big. Knock at the cabin? And then I figured, knock at the cabin. I got really big. I was like around 315 pounds and I put it to weight on really fast. So not so like 315 all, in WWE? No, definitely not. You know, when I was, when I was younger, I was carrying lots and lots of muscle. This I had to put on like, you know, um, between films. I had a very short period of time to put this weight on and I packed it on with French fries and pancakes. I mean, that's how I did it. And the director asked me, he also he said, you know, I don't want you to look like a power lifter. I just want you to look like a great big guy. And so now looking back at it, man, I, I probably overdid it. I was probably a little too big. <laughs> but at the time, I was just thinking, I got to get big. got to get big. I got to get big. And I put on uh, an uncomfortable amount of weight, and it took me forever to shed it off. And then I noticed, like, the more I trimmed down, the better I felt. Mm-hmm. And I also noticed the more I trimmed down, the better I looked on camera the better I look next to other actors because typically next to, even at this weight, that's weird because people think like for me, people say, God, you're skinny. I've even saw like online, some people are worried about my health. And when I say it out loud to people, I'm 6'4", 240 pounds. Yeah. You know, which sounds like, it's, it sounds like when you say that out loud, it sounds like I'm a big person. It sounds like you'd play but, in the NFL. But to me, but you know, to me, because people have seen me so much, you know, so, you know, so much bigger over the years. And, you know, it's, uh, they think I'm like anorexic, but I'm still, I'm just a large human being. So at 6'4", 240 pounds next to your typical actor, I look like a gorilla and it's distracting. <laughs> so, so uh, I'll probably lose like a few more pounds. Um, but then that's, I mean, cause I'm basically killing myself to be this trim. I mean, I'm training hard, not only training hard, but my calories are pretty restricted. And what are we talking I don't know, maybe 2,500 calories a day. That's like enough for someone my size. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for me, it's like nothing. I mean, I'm yeah. just not eating much. And I'm not starving or anything, but I am like that. I don't, you know, like I intermittent fast, so I don't eat for, like I haven't eaten yet. It's like almost one o'clock. Wow. And then I typically don't eat like three, four hours before I go to bed. So it's just like a very few. That's eaters. a short window. A short window. Yeah. yeah. The thing that I think is so great about you is when you say, I'm going to see a Dave Batista film, hmm. that could mean anything. Like you don't have a specific type of movie, right? What, which, uh, so that's great <laughs> on one hand, but this is like what makes me you know, a little nervous about you know Killer's Game. On the other hand, but you're a Swiss Army knife. Yeah, I, you know, and I hope people see that, but they haven't. So I haven't established myself in this type of role. So it's you know, it's, you know, I wonder. I still have to guess. I hope that people want to see me in these types of roles, but I just don't know because I'm not established. They've seen me in one action film. I love Dave in that action film. He's got a new one coming out. I'm going to see it. But they haven't really seen me in, in this type of film. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that their curiosity or they're just, you know, big enough fans where they just, they know that I'm going to put my all into this and they'll be willing to go out and see it. But when we see your face on an, a poster like this right. for an action film, it's believable. You go, oh yeah, of course. He's I, an action star. I hope. And I hope. <laughs> But it's still, I, like, I, it's weird because I never, I always tell people, like, I'm not really sure where my audience is because I've been kind of all over the place with my career. And a lot of, you know, a lot of the fans who are, you know, real hardcore fans when I was wrestling, they, you know, they love me because they love that character. Mm. And obviously I'm not that character in person. And also because I've aged and I'm not jacked and I have gray hair and I have a bald head now, you know, I don't know if they still, you know, are invested in me, but. 
Again, it's always maybe it's a little bit of my insecurity. <laughs> I don't know what does the Venn diagram look like of wrestling fans and Dave Batista movie watchers. I'm sure it's pretty big. I hope, <laughs> but I just don't know. It's always, uh, you know, yeah, I can never tell. I, you know, I don't know. Do you have a lot of people that still come up to you now talking wrestling? Like, oh man, I remember this match. Most of the people who come up to me and recognize me are from wrestling. Wow, wrestling fans. Wow. And it's I and I think it's because you know, and sometimes it takes them a second because I do do look so different from when I was wrestling. But I think it's because most of my bigger film roles, I've been in heavy, heavy makeup, and they don't make the connection. You know, I mean, we think about my Marvel. You know, obviously Drax has been my biz- biggest success on screen. Yeah. You know, most people have seen Marvel films, Guardians of the Galaxy films, the Avengers films. But to make the connection when you see Drax and do they see me, I, you know, I don't know. I think hardcore fans or people who are just really into it would know. But I don't think your you know, average person would make the connection. We'll get back to the conversation with Batista in just a second. But this episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The same formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. You told me in an interview years ago, you'd rather go broke than wrestle again. And people were like, what do you mean rather go broke? Like he doesn't know anything about that. Yeah. They don't realize your story. Yeah. And where you were before you got drafted. Always surprises me, yeah. Always surprises me that where, people... So where were you for people who don't know? Well, before I got drafted, yeah. I was broke again. <laughs> but I, you know, I think people... It's weird because I don't know how people thought that I was brought up. But I was... I mean, when I was a kid, we were... You know, a lot of times we didn't have food. You know, we... Me, my mom, and my sister slept in a basement of a house in D.C. And we all shared one bed. I mean, I didn't grow up with money. I grew up with less than no money I, I i mean i had a pretty rough childhood and we were i was broke until i was well into my 30s I, and this is what led me into wrestling i was broke and had two kids and i was bouncing and i couldn't afford to buy my kids christmas presents one year and i had to borrow money to buy my kids christmas presents and i was so humiliated that i said i gotta make a change i gotta do something i didn't have many choices because i had no education it was high school dropout and so I started, you know, I was an athletic person. I was enormous. And I thought, you know, I'll give wrestling a shot. And I failed in my first attempt. And then I paid someone to teach me how to wrestle um, off of the Wild Simone. God rest his soul. Um, it was so heartbreaking that he's passed away. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that was kind of it. That's where my journey started. But even after that, it was a long, long road. You know, a lot of people didn't believe in me, even... When I was in developmental camp down in OVW, there was people with the WWE, John Laurinaitis, who wanted to fire me. <laughs> but I just kept digging in and digging in and digging in and digging in until I finally got my real first opportunity with, you know, with Evolution. And I had access to Triple H and Ric Flair, I mean, two of the greatest professional wrestlers ever. And I, did, I wasn't going to blow my shot, man. So I just, uh, it was, I had blinders on. There was, I put everything else in the back burner and focused on my wrestling career. That OVW class at 2002 is talked about all the time. It's legendary, right? Mm -hmm. Did that help you or hurt you? Like help you in the fact that you're learning and growing with Randy Orton and John Cena, Mm -hmm. Brock Lesnar and Shelton Benjamin, or does it hurt you that now you need to do that much more to be better than them? It didn't hurt me as far as they went. They only helped me. They only drove me. Like when you are surrounded by greatness, it brings out the best in you. And these guys, to say they were competitive was would be a massive understatement. I mean, it was a class full of studs, man. These guys were, were athletes. And so I was good there. I needed them. I, you know, thank God they were there. What hurt me was my character that I had in OVW because I really had, um, 
And again, I always get grief about this because people think that I don't respect Jim Cornette, you know, and I, and I really do. And the reason I do is because Jim Cornette taught us so much about the history of wrestling. He taught us so much about the traditions of wrestling. But I won't back down when I say that career, that um, character, it stunted my growth in OVW because I had nothing but squash matches. That's what I did. Leviathan? Leviathan. I went out in two, three moves and my matches were over. I had Goldberg matches. And they didn't, I didn't, I didn't progress like the rest of the guys. I didn't progress like Brock Lesnar or Randy Orton. You know, even those guys are incredible athletes. And, you know, obviously with Randy being a legacy, you know, I think he was born and bred into this business. But I was just stunted a little bit. I never got to speak on the mic. I spoke on the mic a few few times and it was me screaming into the mic. But I just, I, I think my growth there was, it was a little bit stunted. And I went into the um, WWE completely unprepared. And it was like a whole new learning curve. And I and I remember it, and I will say it over and over, that Fit Finley in a day changed my life. You know, I went, and that was kind of a last-stitch effort. You know, John Lauren and I sent me down to work with Fit and Steve Regal, um, Dave Taylor. And Fit just took me aside and just started talking to me. Like, what, you know, what's wrong with you, dude? What's wrong with you? And more than the physical stuff, he just got in my head a little bit and made me see things differently. And a light bulb just went off in my head, man. Did Devon see something in you when you were paired with him as Deacon? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think so. I think <laughs> it's weird because, you know, Devon was, a, he was just at a different point in his career. And I think, I don't know if he saw something in me, but I know for a fact that Devon liked me. Like we got along really well and we, you know, and he tried to teach me as, as much as he could. I learned a lot from Devon, but the light bulb really didn't go off until I, I got with it. That the light bulb went off. What's the story behind you getting an evolution? Because Mark Jindrak had that spot. They even filmed, no, he never had that spot. But they filmed something with him, right? That was after. So after oh. I got injured. So I was with OVW and I got injured. And I was out for a while. And they didn't want to keep waiting for me. They thought they should fill the spot. So they were, they were testing out Mark Jindrak. And they did film some stuff with him. And it just, they just decided it just didn't work as well. And they, so they wanted to wait for me to come back and be healthy. Yeah, but yeah, I know because I've heard that rumor and it was just not true. Well, there's the video and yeah. like you see them four walking yeah, yeah. down the street. Yeah. And then you see what that evolution. That was filmed way after we started evolution. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because then you see what evolution became and it's like, yeah. oh yeah, like how could it yeah. be anyone other than these four? Yeah. No, it was always meant to be us four. And also what a, what a great theme song. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. <laughs> that theme song's so good. Yeah. Do you remember when you heard your theme song for the first time? Yeah. Yeah. I remember. I, I didn't, uh. I don't think uh, I, I liked it, but you know it, it it changed a little bit through the first couple of years, and I think when they really when saliva got a hold of it and laid down the lyrics and everything is when it really it just was I loved it. That's when it pumped me up. Are there certain lyrics from that song that you really relate to? Um, I mean, you walk alone. I do. Uh, you know, I'm somewhat of a loner, but also at the same time, like uh, you know, I have people I've people I'm very close to that uh. You know, I love and I depend on, you know, I, um, I know that I can do things on my own, but I like having people there. You know, it's just that I have a very, I'm not a very outgoing person. I'm not a super trusting person. Um, so my circle is very close, you know, but I, I love these people, which is why I think if you talk to people close to me, they'll tell you that I'm very generous with them, that I'm very loving to them. I don't hold back. Like I, I wear my heart on my sleeve. I love someone. I tell them. You know, but, uh, you know, people close. And I also, you know, people that are close to me, I hold to a very high standard. I expect a lot out of them, you know, and sometimes they may, you know, it might seem like pressure on them or like I'm, I don't know, too demanding. Mm. But it's just because I love them. I see something in them. I am on my way to the top. Nobody's going to stop me and they need to pick it up and come with me. You know, they you know, strap on their boots <laughs> and say, man, let's, we're going to do this all together. We're all going to grow together. It's crazy that you don't think you're already at the top. No, I'm not at the top. I know for a fact I'm not at the top. I, I just, I, 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 I guess I just, uh, I'm on a mission. But there. isn't there that whole thing that then you'll get to the top and then you still will think there's another mountain to climb? And No, I don't think there's, I, I don't think it's that. I don't think it's, you know, if you get to the top and there's, you know, you get complacent and, or maybe you see another mountain. I, I think this is the way I've, I've done my career. When I am doing something I love, I put everything into it, but it always leads to something else. It leads to another avenue. So 
even if you feel like you may be at the top of one thing, I guarantee you it's going to lead you to something else. So now where I'm at is, like, I was just an actor, and I wanted to be an actor, and I wanted to be the best actor I, I could be, and I still want to be that. Yeah. Uh, I still have a chip on my shoulder to prove that. Like, I'm not in award-winning conversations. Like, I want to be. I don't care about the awards. The awards, you know, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, say, I, accolades don't matter to me. Mm. But I want to hear people say, talk about me in that light. Like, I want to be in those conversations. You know, I don't need a trophy. You know, it doesn't mean as much to me as being in the conversation. Say, you know, like, Dave's that good. Dave's mm. proved himself that good. Dave can step on stage with this person, that person, all the best in the world. Like, I want to be in those conversations. But, like, I wanted to do that. And that led me into, now I want to be a part of the process. I want to be a part of I don't want to be somebody's, I don't want to be somebody's bitch. I'm like, I don't want to be an actor. Of, you know, go to your trailer and wait till we're ready for you. Okay, come when you're ready. All right, go to your trailer now. I don't want to be that guy. Like, I want to be involved in the process. I want to be involved in the creative process. I want to have some say so on my characters and story arcs, the whole thing. So that led me into producing. Now, same, because I was always acting to pay the bills and wanted to produce, but because I was always so busy acting, I couldn't contribute as much as a producer because I was done there and I was letting people down. I was disappointing. So the solution to that, start my own production company, hire people that can pick up the slack for me when I'm not available. So now I want, you know, I want my company to be successful and I have people depending on me. Uh, so now it's a whole different ballgame when you start employing people and employing people are really counting on you uh, when you're providing livelihood for people. And it's a whole different type of pressure. What does your process look like when you get a script? When you're becoming that character, where does it start? Um, and it depends on whether I'm, you know, I, like I'm not afraid to take a role. It's a smaller role. How about Joe here? So that was the whole process. <laughs> 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 because um, this was a long, this script has, had been along, around a long time. And it had come to me twice before we finally got it and said, we're going to make this. But when it came to me the first time, it wasn't it really, I don't think it was comedic at all. It wasn't really a kind of a rom-com type film. It was more of a straightforward action film. Uh, but I got it, and I thought there was something there. So typically, if there's a script like this, where I, I like the character, I like the premise, I, I think, just think it needs some love. This is where it comes in, you know, uh, handy to be a producer on the film. Because mm -hmm. now you can start to give notes, and now you can start to contribute to it creatively. And so that's what it was. It was just this whole process. And then it came the process of getting the story right to where I felt like it was going to be a fun movie. And then it came time to casting. And so when it came time, like I never, since the first time I got this script, never, ever saw anyone else but Sophia Botello playing Maisie. And when it came, each time it came back to me, I was like, let's start talking about Sophia. Last time it came back to me when we're finally going to make this. So we're in pre-production. We got the budget. We're ready to go. All right, let's talk about Sophia. Sophia is not available. We're going to have to wait then because I can't see anybody. So it became one of those games where, yeah. you know, they were bringing me other actresses. I kept saying, no, no. Well, Sophia's dates aren't working. Can we change this? Change? So we started changing a bunch of things around, and we finally we just made it work. And I think the payoff is in the film because Sophia and I are just, we just, we make sense. It's just we are, we have just really, really good organic, organic chemistry. And so it just makes sense. Well, but uh, Sarah, I know that's a long no. <laughs> answer to your question. <laughs> and this but that's is... how it process. But so just and going back to a smaller yeah. film where it's just a role. So if it's just a role and I'm not offered an opportunity to produce, or it's just a smaller film, then I know it's not going to make any money and it's not going to make me any money. Hmm. If the role is great and it will further further my career and my reputation as an actor, I'm all over it, which is, you know, which I've done recently. You know, I have a film that's going to be screened at Toronto Film Festival where I took just for the role. I actually paid to be in this movie. Because they couldn't afford my team, and I don't go anywhere without my team. So I paid out of pocket for my team. Wow. Yeah. This is the film debut of Drew McIntyre. Yeah. What role did you have in getting Drew in this film? Um, really just pointing everybody towards Drew. Because I was having a conversation with JJ, and he said, I need a great big guy, a great big guy who's like almost intimidating to you, a guy who would be kind of dwarf you, be bigger than you, and say, you know, and I also need him to be able to pull off a Scottish accent. And he was like, do you know anybody? I was like, man, I got the perfect guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I immediately, I mean, I immediately thought of Drew. And I, and I love Drew. I, I've always gotten along with Drew. And I've known Drew probably since he was a teenager. I think he was like 19, 18, 19 when I met him. Man. And um, so I, I just, you know, I pointed him in this direction. I sent him a bunch of pictures, some reference stuff. And I was like, this is a guy. Like, don't even look any further. 
And he said, oh, I love him. I love him. So immediately I hit up Drew. I said, hey, man, would you be interested in? He said, absolutely. I said, check with Hunter and make sure you're cool. And, I, and thank God, like Hunter, because things have changed a lot. Like Hunter's, I think Hunter's changed the company in a lot of great ways. But he's very open-minded to letting people do stuff outside of the company because he, he really understands that the bigger star they become, the more attention will bring back to WWE, which is a great thing. Yeah. Where I think in the past it was just kind of the opposite. Everything, we wanted to keep everything contained, everything, everybody in-house, which is why I ended up leaving the company because I wasn't afforded the opportunity to do stuff outside of the company. But now the way things are now and their structures, Hunter was like, yes, you know, we want you to do this. This brings more eyes onto the WWE. Do you keep in touch with Triple H? Yeah. He's he's a big Dave Bautista movie fan. Well, I don't know if he likes my movies. Probably I'm think, sure he, he does. He probably thinks I'm a shit actor. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I've always clicked with Hunter. I get Hunter and Hunter gets me. And I, I think we could go a year without talking to each other. And then when we pick up a conversation, it's like we just talked to each other yesterday. If you don't think you've made it to the top in what you're doing right now in mm. film, do you feel like you made it to the top in wrestling? No, I think if I had stayed longer, I, I might have. You know, there's a part of me that always thinks, you know, right guy, right time. Um, but I, I you know, I, I don't know what I would have achieved if I would have been like a, a John Cena or Randy Orton, been the, you know, 13, 14, 20 time world champion. I don't know. Um, but I think what I did in the short period of time that I was actually there, you know, my kind of my run between 2005 and 2010. I'm, I'm proud of. I can say that I'm proud of it. I, uh, you know, I've had the conversation with Hunter about you know going into the Hall of Fame, and I was always a part of me that makes me feel like my career is not worthy of going into the Hall of Fame. Wow! And then Come he, on. well, he and he said this to me, and this makes sense. And he said, you know, with what you accomplish, you know, he said you accomplished a lot in the short period of time you were there. I think it's worthy. He said, but if you don't feel like it's worthy, look at it this way: what you've accomplished outside of the company makes you, you know, a Hall of Fame WWE wrestler. Mm. And I and I would tend to agree with that. I think I've uh I think I've co- accomplished a lot and I've never I turned my back on my roots. I've always been very proud of it, very been very open about being a, you know, WWE superstar. And I think so I I think I'm a good ambassador for the company. And I think if, you know, on those merits if they want to put me on the Hall of Fame, I, I'd be proud to accept. You when you retired, you retired. That was it. That's it. You know? Yeah, done. That's it. You're done. Yeah, yeah. John Cena announced a year and a half in advance he's going to retire. Right. right? He's going to go on this uh, retirement tour. That's exactly. So, uh, you know, I really, I, I get along with John. I respect John a lot, a lot more than people think I do for some reason. I think I think the internet and I think fans have built this rivalry between us, which there it really isn't. Um, But this is how, like, we're different. Like, I would never do this. I wouldn't, I couldn't. I wouldn't feel, I would feel disingenuous to me to go around and I, I just I couldn't work but where I see his point where he wants to go around and he wants to personally thank all the fans but there's just something in me where I, I just I couldn't do it it would feel uncomfortable to me like accolades feel uncomfortable to me like I could never be the type of baby face who was saying good stuff because I wanted to get the crowd to cheer for me like I couldn't be that guy and I just, uh, so I, I, you know, I love and respect what he's doing with his whole tour to say, you know, thank you to the fans. But we're just different that way. Like, I couldn't, like, I, I couldn't do it. I went out the way I wanted. I retired the way I wanted. I didn't want to, I didn't want to make a big deal out of it. I announced my retirement on Instagram, you know, and I knew I was going to do it. Yeah. I just didn't want to tell anybody I was going to do yeah. it because I didn't want, I didn't want anybody to say, no, no, you got to come in. You got to give a speech, you know, the fans and. Yeah, I don't know. Just something about it would have felt false to me. And I just I couldn't do it. Speaking of Cena, Mm -hmm. let's take it back to the Royal Rumble Mm -hmm. when the the botched finish, right? You're standing there in the the ring. What's going through your mind when Vince runs into the ring and you don't know what's happened at the time, but he can't stand up? Yeah, well, the whole day I thought I was getting fired. The whole day was was just a nightmare. (laughs) They didn't tell you you were winning? No, I knew I was winning. But what happened was, so I, I think we were in Bakersfield, but I was in, I think we were in San Francisco the night before. And so I stayed there. Instead of driving to Bakersfield, I stayed there because my mom lives there. And I want to stay and I want to spend time with my mom. So I got up the next day and I drove. And I was really late to the show. I was really late to get, getting there. And I knew that I was supposed to go over that night. And it was like a big deal. And I was going to go to WrestleMania. And Vince thought 
that I was being super disrespectful by showing up late. And he was pissed. And I thought he was going to change his mind. It was going to change like the whole storyline. And so I got there and he reamed me out as soon as I got there. <laughs> but then we, you know, the match and it was botched. And I totally take blame for it because I went over. We knew, I knew what the finish was. And I just went over. I just went over and thank God we landed when we did kind of, you know, at the same time. Yeah. It was a miracle. And then when I saw Vince coming down, I was like, Getting fired. <laughs> <laughs> Most of my career, until like later in my career, um, I, I, I throughout my career, especially even in OVW, I thought any day now I'm getting fired. I'm getting fired. I was just so happy to be there. At what point do you realize he's torn both quads? I think like later on. I didn't realize during the match. I didn't know why he was sitting there. I had no idea what was going on, and I was just worried about the match. And then they got him out of there. I think I found out later on. And the funny thing was, so... <laughs> So I think, I can't remember where we were at, like, the next day. But it was the next day, and I got to the building, and they, I, somebody immediately said, Vince wants to see you in his office. And I was like, ah, here it comes. So I went, went to his office, and my heart is beating. I'm, like, just in my head, packing my bags. <laughs> and I walk into his office, and he's sitting. He's got his crutches beside him. He's all banded stuff. <laughs> and he walks in, and he just starts laughing. And he's laughing at like at the top of his lungs, ha, 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 ha. And I was like, you're not going to fire me? And he goes, no, I loved it. It was real. It was so great, and it was real, and nobody would know what was going to happen, but, but he loved it. I think, I think that Vince thrives on chaos. I think he needs, you know, I mean, you think about some guy who's, you know, he's a billionaire. He's accomplished everything. He could, he's bought everything that he could ever buy. He has everything. Yeah. So what's he got left? Excitement. <laughs> and I think because that moment was so chaotic, yeah. I think it just excited him. It exhilarated him. And so even though it was t a total botch, yeah. I think he just had so much fun in that exhilarating, exciting moment that he kind of he thrived on it, and he forgave me. <laughs> I could talk to you all day. I'm yeah. getting the wrap over here. Thank you for just being the kind person you no, are. No, I appreciate it, man. Thank I you. appreciate you. And I'm going to ask you the question I ask at the end of every interview because yeah. gratitude is such a big part of my life. Right. I wake up every day. I, I say out loud three things I'm grateful for. Yeah. My wife and I do it before we go to bed every night. Yeah. What are three things, Dave, that you're grateful for right now? Uh, three things I'm grateful for? Um, I'm grateful, obviously, for my health. Um. I'm grateful that my mother raised me the way she did, and I'm uh, grateful for dogs. <laughs> and do dogs are my happiness. Dogs are my happy place, are my joy in life. Dogs are my therapy. Dogs are uh, dogs are everything. If you can't appreciate the simplicity, the curiosity, the innocence, and joy that dogs bring to the world, then you're you're just a despicable human being. <laughs> How many you got? I have four. Amazing. Yeah. You're the best, Dave. Yeah, thanks. Thank I you so much, it, Chris. Yeah, it's always a pleasure, Appreciate man. Thanks, you, brother. Yeah. Great to see you. Oh, my gosh. Thank you.